Well, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to all. Able to be with you. And I <clears throat> are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. David, will you pray for God's blessing on Certainly. this morning's study? My pleasure. Thank you. Our loving Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Father God and Holy Spirit, we just really appreciate all the blessings that you give us every day. We thank you for the blessing of this week. We come together on this Sabbath to discuss your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, we're learning about covetousness, the sin of the heart, the sin that is difficult to control. Silent but deadly causes chaos. Lord, please help us so that we can learn and apply. Be with the people that are listening so that they can hear not my word, not our word, but the word from the Holy Spirit. And convict them with the power to overcome covetousness. Help them arrive to church on time. And those who will be watching, help them so they can learn and understand and be a blessing to others. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Doc. That was a great, great prayer. Thank you. What a blessing. The memory text for this week's lesson is found in Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 15, and it is um, quite a verse. It says to us, take heed. When the Lord tells you and me to take heed, you and I better take heed. So it says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. I really want you to think about that verse. What you are... And what your life is, is not or should not be about the things you possess or the degrees you are. That is absolutely um, an important verse for this, uh, this week's study. Here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. Covetousness may be defined as undue affection for the material things of life especially those material things belonging to somebody else. Covetousness is a big deal. It is big enough to be right up there with lying and stealing or murdering. Covetousness is so damaging that God chose to warn against it in his great moral law, the Ten Commandments. And so we read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 17, and this is the 10th commandment. This is what it says. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You see, in Scripture, as Elisa will explain to us on Sunday's lesson. Covetousness is one of the gravest of sins. Scripture also tells us that covetousness leads human beings to abandon the faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, tells us, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and the snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which draw man in destruction and prediction. And then verse 10 tells us, For the love of money is a root for all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the satisfaction with what we have often creates the desire to secure more by forcing others to give up all or part of what they have rather than by toiling honestly ourselves. Therefore, covetousness 
is the cause of many of the world's insoluble problems. And we, as, uh, we in, in our country, in the United States of America, are facing just that every day. Every day of our lives. Absolutely. What we need most is not higher wages or larger profits or a lot more materialism. What we need is a change of heart and mind that will lead us, as we read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness in full confidence that the necessities of life will be given to us. As we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 and 11, and I'm not going to read that for you today, Happiness does not depend on things we acquire, but on the state of our mind and our heart. If only that, the solution to the problem of covetousness, which in reality is greed and lust, is to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, as we are urged to do in Galatians chapter 5, Verses 22 and 23. And here's what the verse says. Or these two verses say. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. You probably know that by heart. Against such there is no law. That's the perfection of our character. is reflected on those, uh, on those characteristics. Those who follow Jesus deny themselves and take up the cross. As we read in Luke 20, uh, chapter 9, verses 23, thus escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust, as the Apostle Peter explains in 2 Peter 1, 4. In other words, by imitating God, the giver of all things, including the things that we give Him, we walk in love, just as Jesus walked. Love for sinners inspired Jesus to give himself selflessly for us, an offering and a sacrifice. When our lives are led by the grace of Jesus and by prayer, they will confirm the Bible truths. It is more blessed to give than to receive, tells us the Bible in Acts 20.35. And God loves a cheerful giver, as we read in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. This week's Sabbath school lesson, we will look at examples of just how bad covetousness is and what we can do to overcome it. Elisa, Sunday's lesson. Mm -hmm. How did sin arise in God's universe? That is, that is a very good question, and... You know, to, to answer this question, we have to expand the definition of covetousness because Satan, Satan, what he really desired was the position and the worship of God that was the, only right. the prerogative of God. So Satan, Satan did not have a lack of possessions, material possessions. In fact, he was, the Bible tells us that he was created in a beauty and perfection beyond any of the angels. Right. And so therefore... Um, it's an important lesson for us to think about in terms of what is covetousness in our own life, because it may not be something material, right? Um, and so this is a good lesson for us. And thank you for retitling the lesson. I appreciate that because uh, I, I didn't care for the title. Um, so let's talk about how did sin arise in God's perfect universe? And what are the warnings and lessons for us today? So from what we learn in the Bible, sin arose in Lucifer's heart. That's right. what it says. Amen. He wanted to be like God and to be God, really. And so by allowing his thoughts to become discontented and dwell on covetous thoughts, he corrupted his ways. And he also deceived other angels and destroyed their lives along with his own, eternally. And from the Bible, we learn how dangerous it is to dwell on self-centeredness and covetous thoughts. In Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we read, 
How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will send into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation to the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So in these verses, we learn that Lucifer, this favored being, who is called the son of the morning, traded his honored position in heaven to become the enemy of God. Now, having been expelled from the heavenly realms and the society of God, he will ultimately meet his fate in complete destruction. That's what the text just told us. So why? These verses say that in his heart he desired to be exalted above all others and become like the Most High God. So love of self, self-promotion, and covetousness of the position of God led to discontentment in Lucifer's heart and then to rebellion and then to the, the deception of others, and ultimately loss of his heavenly position and favor. In Ezekiel 28, 17, we read, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. So this verse gives a little more detail. We learn that Lucifer was indeed a very beautiful being, but he allowed his beauty to become a sneer and he corrupted his thinking, his wisdom, through self-exaltation, self and he was cast out of the presence of God as a result. Ellen White in the Patriarchs of Prophets writes, Not content with his position, though honored above the heavenly host, he ventured to covet homage due alone to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of all created beings, it was his endeavor to secure their service and loyalty to him. And coveting the glory with which the infinite Father had invested his Son, this Prince of Angels aspired to power that was a prerogative of Christ alone. So in the New Testament, Paul writes to the early churches about the deception of covetousness. Let's take a look at a few of the verses and what he has to say. In Ephesians 5.5, 5, he writes, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And in Colossians 3.5-7, to 7, we read, Therefore, Put to death your members, or the limbs of your body, um, which are on earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So Paul, Paul clearly is pointing out that covetousness is idolatry. Yep. It's putting oneself above God. Furthermore, he, he includes that covetousness, he, he does include covetousness amongst a list of lifestyle choices that are an abomination to God. So in, first, in, in Romans 1.25, Paul states that people that live this way exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. So as people called to Christ, we are to have no tolerance for or give any sympathy towards these sins in our lives. Paul goes on to say we are to put to death those desires in our members or figuratively in our own bodies. In other words, complete abstinence from such things. Furthermore, in Ephesians 5.3, he says to not even let those things be named as something fitting amongst members of the church. I mean, think about it. How, how many times do we turn a blind eye or, you know, let things creep in that a century ago would not have been included in the church, right? Mm -hmm. So why? The lesson points out that perhaps Lucifer at first did not know where his wrong desires would lead. And certainly that is the same with us. 
The commandment against covetousness is the only commandment that deals only with thoughts. Obeying this commandment can save us from violating other commandments as well. For example, in, in 2 Samuel 11, we read the story of David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. What started as a desire in David's heart led to idolatry and murder. What began as coveting became a heinous act of deception and violence, not only in what he did, but also in causing others to sin. So I'll leave you with this one thought from 1 Corinthians 6.20, which says, For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Thanks so much, Elise. And I'm, I'm so glad that this lesson really begins with Lucifer, because as you stated, it is not, it wasn't about a bank account. It was not about the goods. Yeah. It was not about assets. It was not about anything like that. But it was about the fact that he failed to realize that he was a creature. And as a creature, he needed to really honor his creator. Yes. We are now, in, on Monday, we, we're now going to look at what happened in Israel after Jericho's victory. Yes. You know, the story about Jericho's victory and afterwards what happened in Joshua chapter 6 and 7, I encourage all of you to read it because to me, it's the great controversy that's just playing out among the Israelites. And you will see how this resembles what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were tempted and they fell into sin. It is amazing. So today's um, lesson, Monday's lesson, the topic is an accursed thing in the camp. And in my first slide that I put it, covetousness is the accursed thing in our hearts. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll see commandment number one, love, the God, love God with all your heart, and the commandment number ten, both of them are mirror images of each other because it is the commandment of the heart. Mm -hmm. And since Victor said that um, co co you know, covetousness is wanting somebody's material, since God owns everything, exactly. if we covet, we're going against God. Against God. No matter what, or even matter. if somebody deserves it, we feel like they deserve it. Exactly. Still, it's going against God. So commandment number one and ten are the commandments of the heart, and they're mirror images of each other. And violating either one will violate everything. Correct. And that is why it is so important. So slide number two, it says, um, you know, I was talking about um, here that Israelites crossed, you know, the, uh, the Jordan River. And they come and they conquered Jericho. Here, things are really good. But the interesting thing is, you know, when things are good, guess what? Our heart wants more. Amen. So don't think that we have a relationship with God, everything is good, we're good. We actually have to watch for covetousness even more when things are good. And that's why America, our culture, is such an, full, of, full of abundance, like Victor mentioned it. We got to watch for this covetousness all the time. And now we go back to slide number three. We go back and see what happened before Jericho was conquered. Um, Jesus showed up to Joshua. And Joshua asked, are you for me? Or for the other people? What does Jesus say? No. But as the commander of the army of God, I'm here. Jesus is not for any, he doesn't do partiality. This is a judgment call. Why did the Israelites come to the promised land after 400 years? Because they were sinning and coveting and idolatry was rampant. They did not come to gather their position or get power or get rich. They came so that they can establish the throne of God without covetousness in a land what we was filled with this problem, right? So that's what was going on. And so the story of Achan starts in Joshua chapter 7. And it is right away we see that um, Joshua identifies who the problem is, who is the one that caused the problem. And so verse 1 and 2, it says, uh, slide number 7, I encourage you guys to read it, that the children of Israel... They, what did they do? They trespass, okay? Trespass means crossing a line, okay? Crossing a line. You know what happens when you cross a line? You put yourself in the line of fire. 
And that's exactly what happened. They put himself in the line of fire. And Lord's anger burned against Israel. What does that mean? It means God is upset that some lives are going to be lost. He doesn't want that. So he's upset. So verse um, uh, three, uh, 3 to 5, the next slide, slide number 8, we see what's going on here. We see that, in, um, that the Israelites, they thought, okay, you know what? We won Jericho. They forgot. It was Jesus that delivered them. But so what did they do? They sent spies and they say, oh, we have 2,000, 3,000 people. We can just win it. See, the, we, this is, even though this is a story of Achan, but actually the Israelites, the whole nation, started to like the fact that other people are afraid of them. They are coveting that power that they were getting they totally forgot that God is the one in control. So they go to Ai and they die. And they just, they're defeated and they're just so scared. So they come back. And slide number nine, we see that what happens. Joshua then falls on his feet, verses six to nine. Joshua falls on his feet and everybody else. And they, they're just, you know, put their face on the ground. And they're asking God, why, why, why? They're kind of in a blaming tone, wouldn't you say, Victor? They'll be like, why, why did you do this? We're going to be dead. I mean, well, you know, just all this anxiety, you know. But they, and in, so what, what's the learning point here? When we have trouble, instead of asking God why, we can ask, like what Kennedy says, ask not what God can do for you, ask what you can do for God. Okay, so then, ver, uh, slide number 10, what happens is verses from 10, uh, 10 and 11, God says, get up, get up. You got to do something, right? I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. And here God says it, that Israel has sinned. He's talking about the whole Israel, like I was telling you. They thought they're something, right? They're coveting, liking that power. And then he said, and they also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. So keeping the Ten Commandments is actually keeping the covenant with God, being under his protection. But they, uh, they did not do it. You know, they broke the covenant. Now they're not under protection. So what do you have to do? You have to repent, right? God tells them exactly what to do, okay? Now here, God says, sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself. Uh, and, and then uh, after you sanctify yourself, then I'm going to call on you guys in the morning, and then we'll figure out what to do. But whoever is caught with this, is going to be burned in fire. This is interesting. Fire burning means final judgment. This is a very bad deal. This is going to be a final judgment. And God says in Joshua chapter 7 that this people, this person is doomed for destruction. It's a very strong word. So here, everyone is at fault, but then somebody has crossed the line. He trespassed, and now this is all happening. So then what, what, what to do? Now here's the important thing. God warned everybody, right? clock is ticking. He said, sanctify yourself. Do you see Achan and he's coming out and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I did this. I did this. Please, please. You know, I, he doesn't come out. He doesn't do anything silent. And you'll learn that through, as the story goes, because we're short on time, that he hid them in his tent. That means his family knew. People knew. And they're all silent. Yes, they're all, you know, with him. This is so amazing, you know. And so uh, they're not doing anything. And here everybody's repenting, but that's not true sanctification because true sanctification is true repentance, okay? And remember the story of Ahab when he killed Naboth and the judgment was pronounced on him. What did he do? He put ashes and sackcloth and God said, have you looked at my servant? He repented. I'm going to grant him more life. Nothing of, of this nature to Achan. In fact, I, you know, this is not the first time that Achan did it like whimsically. Oh, I saw something. Let me just take it. This was going rampant in Israel, and that is why God gave the Ten Commandments before they entered the land of Canaan, because he wouldn't have given it if the Israelites didn't have this problem. In fact, covetousness is every creature's in their heart. Imagine Adam and Eve in Garden of Eden. They're perfect, yet they're covetous. You know the free will is? I finally am thinking, Victor can correct me, but free will to me is learning to overcome covetousness. That is free will, and that is love the God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so that is so important. So here, everybody is in it, and they're not confessing, and they already know. But I, I bet you that, you know, Spirit of Prophecy, I'll read it in, on Thursdays, that it is something that was rampant, and he was probably thinking, what's a big deal? Like David, what is a big deal? You know, I'm God's, we're God's chosen people. You know, it's kind of like entitlement. You know, entitlement, covetousness. Beware of those because they go hand in hand. 
And uh, yes, uh, yes, so it's very, very important. So here they don't confess, and then morning comes, and they're coming. And, uh, you know, one by one, Jesus points them out who that bad person is. And then Joshua begs him, say, I beg you, give God the glory. It's still no confession. He begs them. Then he gives, he, he confesses. But here, he's like talking like Satan. He says, you know what? I saw this goodly good. Like, I saw this good stuff, and I couldn't, you know. Here, the whole land of Canaan is cursed, right? That's why the Israelites are coming. They've been cursed for 400 years. Everything is cursed, yet he is saying these are goodly goods. What he's doing is telling everybody, oh, you know what? There's good stuff in there. It's okay. So he pronounced the judgment on himself. There is nothing God can do to protect him because if he let him go and not do anything, if he doesn't show the judgment, guess what? The plan of salvation, Jesus Christ, never happens because this covetousness would destroy the whole nation of Israel and we wouldn't have Jesus. Just like what Satan, you said, Elisha did to heaven, it was, he was doing it again in, in this world, Satan. So that is, the re, that is the whole story. This is where the great controversy every day in our heart, the heart where the hum, humility versus the covetousness. Jesus, the true humble servant without covetousness versus Satan, the covetous um, prince who um, deceives people silently. Friends, we got to be aware. we got to learn the story of Achan because it's happening not then. It happened in the Garden of Eden. It happened in heaven, and it's happening right now in my heart, in all of our hearts, in all of our homes. If we don't stop it, we will all be dead. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That's true. So we've looked at Lucifer. We've looked at Achan and what happened uh, to Israel. And in a sense, both Alicia, Alicia, uh, Elisa and David have really touched on a general characteristic of what covetousness is all about. And Tuesday's lesson, we're going to look at Judas, and I'm talking about Judas Iscariot, Judas, the disciple of Jesus. And one of the most tragic stories in the Bible is that of Judas, Judas Iscariot. I don't know if you ever had um, the opportunity of really looking at the Bible and studying and seeing what happened to this to this man. So this was a man that had a privilege that only 11 other people in all the history of the world had. Judas, just like all the other disciples, had the privilege to be with Jesus during Jesus' ministry here on earth. He was given the opportunity to learn eternal truths directly from the Master himself. As one of the 12 disciples, Judas spent time with Jesus and heard him firsthand. And he participated in Jesus' ministry and the amazing miracles that took place on a day-to-day -day basis. So, yet, as we reflect on his life, it is sad to see that many people who never had anything remotely like the opportunities that Ju Judas had will be saved, while Judas is destined for eternal destruction. And so the question is, what happened? Why? Scripture provides a very clear description of Judas' character, which also includes the condition of his heart and mind. His character is a reflection of his heart and his mind. As we read the Gospels and the prophetic writings, we know that Judas, and like any other of the eleven disciples, approached Jesus and asked to be included as one of his disciples. We also know that the disciples thought highly of Judas. They urged Jesus to bring Judas into the fold. They saw in, Jesus, in Judas a man of keen discernment and executive ability, as uh, <clears throat> Ellen White says in her writings. And so they recommended him to Jesus as one who would greatly assist Jesus in his work. Thus, Judas was included as one of the uh, disciples and became treasurer for the disciples and the ministry that Jesus was developing on earth. So what happened to Judas? Why is he destined for eternal destruction when he assumed a responsibility among the ministry and among the disciples, and he was part 
of Jesus' disciples? Well, the answer can be found in one word, and that is covetousness. The desires of his heart were really the problem that Judas had. By the way, that was Lucifer's problem. By the way, that was Achan's problem. Right, Israel's problem. So in Scripture, as the Gospel describes what happened at the Feast of Simon's house, where Jesus and his friends, and we're talking about Mary and Martha, were invited to attend as guests, John tells us, and I'm going to read this for you, so we're going to go into John chapter 12, verses 3 to 6. Here's the story, and this will reflect the character of Judas. Verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of perfume. That's really 12 ounces of perfume. And, um, and the, perf the perfume came from the spikenard roots. This was very precious at the time. And so anointed, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance of the oil. Verse 4. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. So Judas is at his dad's house. Simon's son, who would betray Jesus, said, verse 5, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? Now, this was equivalent to about a year's wage, a denarii a day. That's really what they were earning at the time. And why wasn't this given to the poor, he asked. Verse 6, So Judas, Judas, Judas said, to, uh, said this, not that he cared for the poor. This is John writing. But because he was a thief, says John, and had the money box, he was the treasurer, had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. That's a sad story. In this passage of Scripture, John clearly identifies and indicates that first, first and foremost, Judas was a thief, that he stole from the offerings given to Christ's work, and that he begrudged the, cost, the costly gift bestowed upon Jesus by a grateful and penitent heart and a friend, Mary. In the Gospel of Mark, and I'm talking about Mark chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to just tell you this. The apostle tells us that Judas and a few others did not approve of Mary's tribute to the Savior because they felt that the anointing of Jesus was a waste of offering money. They felt that this money could have been put to better use by being given to the poor. And if Judas was a thief, it's very probable that he probably wanted some of this money for himself. So in John chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, Jesus provides a response to Judas' criticism. He could not only hear it, but read it. And so Jesus tells um, uh, Judas in verse 7, Jesus said, let her alone, leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, he says. And then in verse 8, For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Scripture tells us in Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16, that Christ's gentle rebuke to Judas' covetous remark led him to leave the feast and go directly to the place of the high priest where Jesus' enemies were gathered. Such was the covetousness, and such was the iniquity of Judas' heart. And so here, here, here's what the Bible says, verses 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests, verse 15, and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Verse 16. 
So from that time, Judas sought opportunity to betray Jesus. That perfume, 300 denarii. Jesus' value, 30 pieces of silver. That's what covetousness does. So what happened to Judas? Having had so many wonderful opportunities, so many rare privileges, why should he do something so evil? Ellen G. White, in The Desire of Ages, page 716, 716, gives us the explanation. Judas loved a great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt a desire to be changed in character and life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. The Savior did not repulse Judas. He gave him a place among the twelve. He trusted him to do the work of an evangelist. He endowed him with power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. And yet, as she writes, Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. We are not much different. You and I are not much different, unfortunately. As fallible human beings, we all have character defects that if surrendered to God can be overcome through the power of God working in us. Unfortunately, Judas did not fully surrender to Christ. And the sin of covetousness, which he could have overcome in the power of Christ, overcame him instead with tragic and fatal results. Elisa, we all should know the story of Ananias mm -hmm. and Sapphira. Yeah. Tell it to us. Another tragic story. Uh, exactly. Lot, lots of important lessons in this study this week. Okay, Ananias and Sapphira. The early church members felt an urgency around the Lord's work, and that led to a unity in behaviors that may seem unusual for us today in terms of how they viewed their personal property and operated as a church body. As a church body living in end times, perhaps we should give much more thought and prayer to how we view life and possessions and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our own choices, individually and collectively. So let's take a look at the story here of Ananias and Sapphira. In Acts 4.32, we read that the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, this is speaking of the early church, and neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So this brings us to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who were members of this early church, and they seemed to be impressed by what was going on and wanting to be part of it. So they decided to sell some of their property and contribute the proceeds to the church. However, second thoughts and a covetous spirit got in the way of them following through on that commitment. Not only does the Bible give us details of this story, but it also has preserved for us a lesson and warning for what awaits us if we treasure the things of this life more than our relationship and our commitments to God. So we're going to read Acts 5, 1 to 11, and it says, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all of those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him, carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. 
She said, yes, for that much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came, found her dead, and carried her out and buried her by her husband. So a great fear then came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. So this story gives us insight into what the true condition of their heart was. No doubt, they made the commitment to God in full belief that they would perform what they had committed. But when the amount from the sale of the property was greater than they believed it would be, they could not help but bring themselves to part with the full amount. And instead, they devised a plan to deceive the church leaders. Covetousness had a much deeper root in their heart than they realized. Ellen White, in the Acts of the Apostles, writes, At first it seemed as if they were sincere in their desire to give toward the work. However, afterward, Ananias and Sapphira grieved the Holy Spirit by yielding to feelings of covetousness. They began to regret their promise and soon lost the sweet influence of the blessing that had warmed their hearts with a desire to do large things in behalf of the cause of Christ. The lesson points out that if Ananias and Sapphira had been successful in their fraud, the credibility of the apostles and the divine legitimacy of the church would have been corrupted from the start. Although the same immediacy of judgment does not occur today, a day will come when all shall give an exact account to the Lord of everything that they have done, whether good or bad. Ellen White further writes in Acts of the Apostles, Not to the early church only, but to all future generations, this, this example of God's hatred of covetousness, fraud, and hypocrisy was given as a danger signal. It was covetousness that Ananias and Sapphira had first cherished. Voluntary offerings and tithe constitute the revenue of the Lord's work. In Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10, the Bible warns us, the heart is a deceitful thing and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So how important is it then for us to humbly submit our wishes, our desires, our thoughts, and all that we do to the Lord and respond in the direction he is bidding us to take? Mm -hmm. Alisa, what an incredible story. Yeah. And you know, I, I had the privilege to grow up in the church, and so, and you, I know, you, you, you guys did the same, and this is always part. And, and to understand that the problem is that I'm just a creature and a steward. Yeah. And I'm a steward of what? Of everything that God has given me. The, 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 not only the physical things, but the intellect and everything that I am. Sure. And when I promise God something and says, God, I, I want to do this for you, and I don't fulfill it, I am covet coveting mm -hmm. that which does not belong to me. Yeah. It's really incredible. Thank you so much for that. David, Yes. Mm. we have now looked at uh, a, yeah. a variety of lives. Yes. And so Thursday really brings a resolution into this and says, how do we overcome covetousness? Yeah, you know, um, as I was listening to Alicia, um, in Acts 4, it talks about how back then, even though God's people did not have a lot of wealth, but they, were, they had no covetousness. They were bringing all the things, and it says that they had no lack. So covetousness actually brings poverty. Right. And here, Ananias and Sapphira went totally against the culture Absolutely. and let them live and keep what they did. And lying means teaching everybody in the church same behavior and allowing Satan it's okay to, to rule the church. It's okay to steal. It's okay, it's okay to, to be a thief. Exactly. Because, you know, why not? Since God doesn't care, right? Yeah. But God cares. This is what's important, what Alicia read. I was going to read that. That 
it is a sin of the heart, just like love the Lord with all your, only God can judge the heart. And that is why only God can be the just judge. That is why we need to realize there's nothing we can hide from them. And covetousness, since one of the things that we hide, and it's easy, and it's common to all creatures in the universe, because our free will must be used to contain that, guess what? God is the only one who will judge us Amen. based on that. In fact, all of our decisions, Victor, are based on true humility versus hidden covetousness. Absolutely. Whether our facial expression, Absolutely. how we address people, because what kind of work do we do? Absolutely. And that's the battle, Jesus and Satan, right? And Jesus won. So guess what? We have to win, right? If we don't win, guess what happened to Achan? God said, God told Joshua he's going to burn him with fire, right? But what Joshua and Israelites did is they stoned him. Victor, you would agree that stoning is a capital punishment in Israel. So when they stoned him, they actually publicly, everybody said, we do not endorse covetousness. And after that, he was burned. But guess what? God is a God of love. So later on, that same valley, it's called the Valley of Accor, became this the valley of the great disaster, became the valley of hope in Hosea. So God is always, he can make impossible from, uh, possible from impossible. So what can we do to tackle this covetousness? You know, the 10th commandment, do not covet, it is the anchor of the 10 commandments. Like we said, it's the mirror image of one and, well, commandment number one. Again, if we live in flesh, we're living with covetousness. But if we have the Holy Spirit, guess what? Covetousness will run away. You know, Lord's Prayer, Victor, I always thought, Jesus said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Always thought, why would that kind of prayer be there? Then I realized what you said. If you're a creature, you're going to have covetousness. So what? What is going to happen? There's going to be temptation. There's going to be things, tests and trials to show that we truly love God. So commandment number one, God says, do you love me, David? And I'm like, uh, looking at my heart, no, I covet. No, I don't. You know, this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the response. So we got to get rid of it. We got to stop it. And the time is today. What does Joshua say? Choose for yourself on this day. Whom shall you serve? As for ye, me and my uh, house will serve the Lord. Since we don't know the future, what will happen tomorrow? The time is today. It's right now. Just like Achan, there's always that time limit. Right, Victor? There's, the judgment will close. So we got to start now. And Jesus is coming soon. So there's two uh, two places that, um, that actually is very good clarity about what we can do to stop covetousness. For me, it, it is Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he, uh, he meditates day and night. And Philippians 4, 4 to 8 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and let your gentleness be known to man. Pray day and night. Pray, and the peace, you need peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Rejoice in the Lord always, right? And it also says that the peace of God will surpass all understanding. So I, there are seven steps that I could think of according to the Sabbath school lesson and according to all the stories. Number one, make a choice today that you and I and all of us are going to be loyal to Jesus no matter what. Because Jesus was the only human being, we talked about it, is without covetousness that lived on this earth. And that is why he could be our savior. Again, number two, Psalms 1, avoid bad company. Eve should have run away from the serpent. As soon as he's talking against God, just run away, anyone. I remember last uh, week on Sabbath school, there are certain jobs that require us to lie and do this and that. If we're in those type of jobs, Try to get out of it as much as Just possible. <laughs> the third point is treat everyone with love yep. and equality. Why? Because God hates people that oppress others. And when we don't treat people with love and equality, guess what happens? They covet. Mm -hmm. They have anxiety. There's no hope. So, they people, so we are responsible at times to create cove covetousness. Just, just don't do that. Love one another. That's why Jesus says, what's the second greatest commandment? Love everyone. Number four, delight and meditate in the law of God. What that really means is read the word of God. In Psalms, it says either we read the word of God or we are, our heart is filled with covetousness. Regular Which regular, essential. essential. How many times did Daniel prayed? Three times a day. 
How many times do Israelites worship? Twice a day. One in the morning and one in the evening. That's what Job did, right? So those are important. Again, we read in Philippians, pray day and night to alleviate anxiety, right? Because why do we have anxiety? Because we have lack of faith, right? And then when you have anxiety, you have lack of faith. Guess what? We want to take charge. And that's when we crave, oh, I wish I had more money. I wish I had this job. I wish I had this power. I wish I looked more handsome or taller or whatnot, you know? These are the things that's going to creep in, right? And that is why we need to stop that. And then, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You read that, Luke 17, 21. Jesus says, take notice, be aware of covetousness. Why do we have to take notice? Because Mrs. Ellen White says, it's silent but deadly, right? And then, true repentance. You know what true repentance was? I realized that the story of the rich ruler Unless we're ready to give away everything for God, guess what? We're still coveting. Okay? So that is why tithe and, tithe and offering is so important. Yeah, yeah, we're still on this earth. Yeah. If yeah. we don't give everything to God, we're still Yeah, it was a coveting, right? I, so that is why tithe and offering is one of the greatest ways to practice not being covetous. Now, I want to read this from, uh, the, from Patriarchs and Prophets um, really quickly. Uh, the deadly sin that led to, this is all, this is summarized here, and I got them all from here. The deadly sin that led to our, uh, Achan's ruin had its root in covetousness of all sins, one of the most common and the most lightly regarded. While other offenses meet with detection and punishment, how rarely does the violation of the 10th commandment so much as call forth censure? You see, you don't go to jail if you covet but we die forever if we keep coveting. Remember that. The enormity of this sin and its terrible results are the lessons of Achan's history. Covetousness is an evil and gradual development. Like we said, Achan just didn't take it. You know what? He knew exactly how many shekels of silver he took. He said, I took 200 shekels of silver, 50 of gold, and I took this good, nice-looking cloth. He was, he, he was, it was calculated. Achan had cherished... Um, and greed of gain until it became a habit, binding him in fetters well nigh impossible to break. He brought that curse on himself. While fostering this evil, he would have been filled with honor, horror at the thought of bringing disaster upon Israel, but his perceptions were deadened by sin, and when temptation came, he fell an easy prey. You see, covetousness, through covetousness, Adam and Eve brought death. Achan brought death. And Ananias and Sapphira brought death on themselves. And, um, you know, a, a, all these stories that we learned, Victor, it is something that we have to think about every day and cast it out in the name of Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. And that's all it's about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Lisa. What a delight to, to be able to uh, spend some time and, and discussing this week's lesson. As uh, my, my final thoughts and, and my appeal to you today, um, I, I really want to concentrate one on what the spirit of prophecy particularly says about this. You know, often we sort of seem to feel uncomfortable with our prophetess, Ellen White. That's right. I, I just want to encourage you. To, to read Ellen White as often as you possibly can. She's a Bible scholar. She's a Bible scholar. Yeah. She was used, used by God to really communicate with us. She's a prolific writer. Um, she has written so much about the Bible, and she really is a minor light mm -hmm. that complements the big light that God is in our life. And so um, here's what I, I, I want to end with. As we've discovered... Through this lesson, as we've studied in this week's lesson, covetousness knows no bounds. It just doesn't. Yeah. Not even when it concerns that which is sacred. The devil is a good example. Mm -hmm. Scripture warns us to beware of covetousness. And the, in, in Luke 12, 15, which is really uh, this week's memory text, God tells us, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things you and I possess, including the talents. It's not just the bank account. It's everything. And here's what Ellen G. White uh, provides in the following information. And I'm going to read from Christ Object Lessons, from two places there. 
and testimony, testimonies for the church. I'm going to read from volume, volume 1 and volume 4 very briefly. So the first of the quotes comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 261. It's a sentence, and here's what uh, uh, Ellen White tells us. All covetousness is condemned as idolatry. Nervous. You heard it. Yep. You heard the doctor. You heard yep. Elisa. Yeah. Idolatry. Yep. All selfish indulgence is an offense in God's sight. And why is it? Because He's the Creator. He's the one who provided. He's the one who's given you and me everything we have and everything we are. That's right. Second statement. Christ Objects Lesson, page 259. She says, To live for self is to perish. Covetousness, the desire of benefit for self's sake, cuts the soul off from life. Exactly. Poverty. Poverty. Yeah. Provides death. Exactly. It is the spirit of Satan to get and to draw to self. That's what Satan was all about. It is the spirit, and then she says, it is the spirit of Christ to give, to sacrifice self for the good of others. It's important that we understand the comparison. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 140, and she's talking to you and to me today. Testimonies for the Church, volume 140. Ellen White makes the following observation. She says, I saw that Israel of God must arise and renew their strength in God by renewing and keeping their covenant with Him. You and I have entered a covenant with God. Let's keep it, she says. Covetousness, selfishness, love of money, and love of the world are all through the ranks of Sabbath keepers. It shook my foundation when I, when I read that statement. Mm -hmm. These evils are destroying the spirit of sacrifice among God's people, she says. Those that have this covetousness in their hearts are not aware of it. It has gained upon them imperceptibly, and unless it is rooted out, their destruction will be as sure as that of Achan's. And the last quote that she has, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 485, says, Christians must look upon themselves only as channels through which mercies and blessings are to flow from the fountain of goodness. Who's the fountain of goodness? Jesus. Christ, from Christ to their fellow man. Exactly. That's what we need to do. Yep. I hope that this lesson has been, in, has been a good lesson for you. I hope that you feel encouraged and, and that you will become just a vessel, a conduit, a vessel of the fountain of goodness to your fellow man and to your household. Let's pray. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for scripture for your word for your love i want to thank you lord for the fact that you love the you loved us so much that you gave it all out and you came to this earth not only to die for us but to demonstrate exactly how we should live our lives lord we want to acquire your spirit a spirit that gives, a sacrificial spirit that is only, that is there also for the good of our fellow man. Father, we want to renew in us through the Holy Spirit a strength in you. We want to keep the covenant that has been made, that you made with us for eternity. Lord, remove covetousness, selfishness, love for money and love for the world so that we truly may be pilgrims on this earth on the way to the new Jerusalem. 
Lord, we want to be channels of good news, channels of mercy and blessing flowing from our heart and the things that you have given us so we can share it and so that those that we come in contact with may embrace you by seeing in us stewards of the kingdom. Father, we want to thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. And we want to ask, O oh Lord, take our will and mold it into yours. Help us die for self every day so that, Lord, we no longer live, but you live in us. And so our character may reflect you wherever we go, wherever we are, every day. For well, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.